Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to WIDA's final webinar of 2020. At least I think it's our final webinar of the year. This, If it is, this will be our 59th webinar since March when we shifted from in-person events to online events. In that time, we've hosted uh, over 9,000 viewers on our webinars on Zoom and almost 15,000 YouTube views. Thanks to all of you. And we have expanded our reach to 40 US states and over 90 countries around the world. We wanna bring your attention to one major event we've already announced in 2021. It will be our third annual Washington International Trade Conference, which will be held virtually on Zoom on February 8th and 9th. We hope you can join us. Information can be found at www.wita.org. While we're very hopeful about vaccines coming available, we, and we hope to meet again in person in 2021. We do plan for at least the first six months of next year to continue hosting all our events virtually. And even when it's safe to meet in person, we will continue to host online events to share our trade programming outside of Washington, DC. Of course, you cannot see each other on all these webinars, but we like to share the names of some of those you are in community with, even if you can't see each other's faces. So please welcome to WIDA today, Mary Slater at USTR. Kristen Hansen at the Embassy of Norway, Natalie Campfus at Johnson & Johnson, and Brad McDonald at the IMF. Welcome Mary, Kristen, Natalie, and Brad. We're delighted you could join us and welcome to all of you today. I also wanna say a special thanks to Daniel Crosby at King & Spalding and his colleague, Hamid Mamdou. It was their suggestion to us that we host an event with key WTO ambassadors who the incoming Biden administration can work with on important WTO matters in the years to come. Today, we're pleased to welcome a very distinguished panel to discuss the work of the Ottawa Group, which has made significant contributions to the discussion of what a, what a positive forward-looking agenda might look at at the WTO in 2021 and beyond. At this time, with the U.S. in transition to a new administration, it's especially important to hear from these key U.S. allies about their work. I won't go into great detail about their biographies, which you should have seen in an online program we sent out by email this morning, but we're delighted to welcome today to the WIDA platform, Ambassador Stephen DeBoer of Canada, Ambassador Didier Champvivier of Switzerland, Ambassador Tan Hung Sang of Singapore, Ambassador Kazuyuki Yamazaki of Japan, and Ambassador George Mina of Australia. Welcome to all of you. The ambassadors will be joined by our good friend and frequent partner, Ambassador Rufus Yerksa, President of the National Foreign Trade Council, and the former Deputy Director General of the WTO and former U.S. Ambassador to the WTO. Rufus will moderate today's discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Rufus? Thank you, Ken, and uh, a big thanks to WIDA and, of course, as you said, to Daniel Crosby and Hamid for suggesting this idea, and a, a big welcome to these five distinguished uh, and hardworking ambassadors uh, who are doing so much to try to move the WTO system forward. Uh, I want to just start by uh, acknowledging the hard work they're doing and, and speak just for a second about why it's important and then um, get them each to, to address the work of the Ottawa Group. You know, throughout the history of the GATT WTO system, uh, there has always been a reliance on small groups to help try to move forward and point uh, a direction for the organization in times of difficulty or crisis. Uh, I remember back when, when I was a uh, US representative, the work of the uh, De La Paix group, which was not dissimilar in configuration to this group uh, during the Uruguay round. Uh, so named, I think, because it was first met at the Hotel De La Paix in Geneva, but uh, the name also suggests the, the kind of peacemaker role that uh, that a group like this can have in a consensus-based system. Uh, and the group dynamics are terribly important. So the Ottawa group and you know these five countries, uh, Canada, Switzerland, Singapore, Australia, and Japan are a very good example of countries that have uh, an enormous stake in the multilateral system, rely on it heavily and are, are deeply committed to promoting uh, the rule of law and the uh, orderly um, conduct of trade between nations uh, through, through good agreements. And we're obviously at a pivotal time now, both in the WTO system and in, in trade 
policy generally globally. So we're very encouraged that this group is working on ideas for, for how to move the system forward. So I thought if we could, I'd start with uh, Ambassador DeBoer, Stephen, uh, since Canada is the convener of the Ottawa group. I'm not sure, I think Canada might also have been a, the convener of the Delapay group back way back in the day, but it might've been Switzerland as well, I'm not sure. So um, Stephen, if you could just start out maybe by giving us a bit of a flavor for the group itself, your, your objectives, your work, and, and how you see the, the picture from the, from the coordinator seat. Sure, absolutely. So I'll start with a, with a word on the Ottawa group. Uh, since its inception in 2018 as a sounding board for proposals and ideas on WTO reform, the Ottawa group has evolved into a forum for developing and advancing concrete initiatives. Ottawa group ministers have now met a total of seven times and have established a strong working relationship. The group is currently working to implement a six point action plan agreed to by ministers this past June, aimed at ensuring that the WTO is well placed to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as future global health emergencies. This work includes uh, working to ensure predictable agricultural trade, completing the e-commerce negotiations, launching work on examining how trade rules can support global responses to health emergencies. And we'll hear a little bit from this from my from my colleagues. In addition to this work, we remain committed to continue pushing for actions in areas like improving the compliance rate of WTO members with existing transparency obligations, revitalizing the negotiating function of the WTO with a focus on ensuring that the organization remains credible and relevant in the 21st century. And then of course, there is the issue of dispute settlement. In the areas I just mentioned, the Ottawa Group's value added proposition is as a forum where proponents can bring forward their ideas and initiatives and receive feedback from a group that represents a broad cross section of the WTO membership. And while all Ottawa Group members are committed to a fully functioning WTO dispute settlement system, the group itself has not spearheaded dispute settlement related initiatives. I want to be clear that any comments I make on, dispute, on the dispute settlement system should not be interpreted as the position of the Ottawa Group. And while the US is not part of the Ottawa Group, our work is meant to be as transparent as possible and we regularly brief US counterparts in Geneva and in Washington on the group's work. Now, if you allow me, I, would, um, I, I will turn now to talk a little bit about dispute settlement. Yes, please. Good, absolutely, okay. So, and, and let me preface this by, by talking about the new administration and US involvement in WTO affairs and leadership will be key to advancing a positive WTO um, agenda. And I also think at the same time, we need to be realistic about timing. We need to recognize that it will probably take a while for the Biden administration to get all of its positions filled and need to recognize that there are some very serious challenges facing the US government, not least of which COVID-19. That said, and I do also want to remind all of you and underline that the US remained heavily engaged in the work of the WTO throughout the past four years. However, it's also taken actions that have undermined the functioning of the organization and that in particular around uh, dispute settlement and more specifically around the appellate body. And it is true that the US administration has voiced concerns about the appellate body or the AB for a number of years. However, the Trump administration through its sustained blockage of appellate body member appointments caused the appellate body to lose quorum in December, 2019. This step was both bold and damaging. And I should say the US has clearly set out the problems that it sees with the functioning of the AB. It's made several statements on the matters in the context of the WTO dispute settlement body meetings, and it published a 120 page report on the appellate body in February, 2020. However, it has not proposed solutions to remedy these issues. And well ahead of the appellate body's loss of quorum, WTO members came together to address US concerns through the so-called Walker process. A dozen proposals were made by members from all over the world, culminating with the presentation to WTO members of a draft decision, often referred to as the Walker Principles. 
These principles were meant to address issues that the US had raised and all Ottawa group members supported the Walker process. Unfortunately, the US blocked the adoption of the draft decision. However, it acknowledged its appreciation for the progress that was made. And we'll have to see whether the US will return to pragmatic discussions towards a multilateral resolution. There's reason for optimism in that regard as the new US administration has indicated it tends to work with allies, including in the multilateral context. The Walker principles could form a part of the solution oriented discussions to fix the AB impasse. Should also say that faced with this impasse, Canada and the EU pioneered what we called a bilateral interim appeal arbitration arrangement to secure dispute settlement rights between us. And that work was an important stepping stone when Canada, the EU, and a number of other members established the multi-party interim appeal arbitration arrangement, or MPIA for short, to safeguard binding two-stage dispute settlement amongst our larger group. We now have 24 participants and it's open to additional members. This is a temporary measure, will be in place only until the AB functions again. And the priority for MPIA participants remains finding a multilateral solution to the AB impasse and one that includes uh, the US. The MPIA replicates the AB process, but it also provides for certain procedural uh, innovations. So in summary, the WTO members have laid out a whole suite of ideas to fix the problems that the US has highlighted. In other words, WTO members worked hard to find solutions. This is a clear testimony to the importance that we collectively accord to having the US on board when it comes to WTO dispute settlement. The US has been heard. We have not yet, however, heard US proposals to resolve their concerns over the AB. And for decades, the US has been a driving force in setting up rules to solidify trading relations, engaging in a solution-oriented dialogue to resolve the AB impasse is the constructive thing to do. I recognize that this may not be the very first item on the new US administration's trade agenda, but I am hopeful that it will be addressed early on at a time that is commensurate with its importance. Canada and all Ottawa group members are open to discuss avenues to reach that solution. And we will continue to advocate for a functioning and efficient dispute settlement system at the WTO and look forward to working with the US and others to attain that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And thanks for getting us started on this discussion of the Ottawa group and its work. I, I wanna turn next to Ambassador Didier Chambové of, of Switzerland. and. Didier is an old colleague of mine during the Uruguay round and his uh, longevity in the Swiss government is, is quite uh, admirable and amazing and I'm glad to be back with him in this uh, dialogue. Uh, and I, Didier, I, I know there may be other aspects you want to address, but I think one of the things we'd like to hear from, I know Switzerland is interested in the work that the Ottawa Group's doing on uh, trade and health. I think the Ottawa Group put out some papers about an initiative on trade and health. So I thought you might want to address that as well as what other, other issues you want to raise today. Uh, thank you very much, Rufus. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for providing me this opportunity uh, to uh, make a presentation of uh, what I think is an important initiative that has been launched uh, by the Ottawa Group. This is the Trade and Health Initiative. Um, as, as we know, in March this year, when the pandemic was beginning to strike our people and economies, many countries or WTO members uh, responded to the crisis in an uncoordinated way with un unilateral export restrictive measures for medical and essential goods. Uh, following this first wave of trade restrictive measures, members started to initiate import facilitating measures by means of uh, simpler and more efficient custom procedures and sometimes suspension of customs duties. Uh, the crisis clearly revealed the lack of coordination and cooperation between countries facing the same problem. As a fact, trade facilitation policies by some were undermined by export restrictions by others. And I will never say it enough, a global crisis requires a global response. And the lessons learned 
are straightforward to ensure the availability of medical and essential goods worldwide we need to facilitate trade in such products and to maximize the impact of such trade facilitation policies wto members should coordinate their practices based on these reflections the Ottawa Group decided to play a leading role in promoting a trade and health initiative at the WTO. The group will communicate in a few days, that is, at the next General Council's meeting on the 16th of December, its plan to launch the initiative early next year. Uh, with this communication to the General Council, the group will invite all WTO members to start acting uh, on this initiative. The initiative is structured in two steps. The first step would take the form of a joint statement of all members, which should be adopted in the first quarter of 2021. This statement would set out immediate actions to respond to the current crisis. This course of actions would consist of unilateral and voluntary measures on the following elements. Reviewing and eliminating promptly and necessary export restrictions, exercising restraint in the imposition of any new export restrictions, considering the interest of the most vulnerable countries with scarce manufacturing capacities, ensuring that trade measures do not disrupt the operation of the global COVAX facility for vaccine distribution, ensuring that measures are targeted transparent, proportionate, temporary, and consistent with WTO obligation. The initiative also proposes to share experience and to establish best practices and cooperation in the implementation of custom services and technical regulations. As we know, a large number of members have undertaken measures to facilitate importation of essential goods by relaxing import licensing requirements introducing fast-track uh, facilities for goods, clearance at customs, and also measures to expedite air or maritime cargo or other services related measures. And we believe uh, this is a good start on which certainly we can build. Uh, in addition, the initiative forces that members would make best efforts to remove or reduce tariffs during the crisis and to intensify efforts to ensure transparency. And finally, the initiative calls for enhanced cooperation between the WTO and other relevant international organizations, including the World Health Organization and the World Customs Organization. Uh, this is with the aim of improving the analytical capacity of members to monitor market developments in trade and production of essential medical goods. The second step of the initiative would consist in building on the temporary measures I have just listed and prepare proposals to work towards permanent commitment at the next ministerial conference. We are mindful, though, that the talks in various configurations may take a different speed and the outcome of such discussions may not necessarily produce a multilateral result. We are, for instance, well aware of sensitivities on tariffs. To conclude, Rufus, I would like to underline that the efficiency of the Trade and Health Initiative requires the participation of as many WTO members as possible. The engagement of the largest trading nations, in particular the United States, is critical. Uh, we have to contribute collectively to the containment of the pandemic and promote economic recovery. And it is in these extreme global situations that multilateralism takes on its full meaning. And uh, it's absolutely clear that we hope to be able to count on the cooperation of the United States next year, early next year, when uh, the initiative will be in full swing. Thank you. Thank you, Rufus. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, and I want to go next to Ambassador Tan of, of Singapore and Hang Seng, uh, maybe picking up from where Didier's discussion about 
trade and health left off, I wonder if you want to talk a bit about how we write the WTO ship in a post-pandemic era, um, how the WTO can help advance uh, economic recovery and stability in the trading system uh, coming out of COVID, but what, of course, whatever else you want to talk about as well. Thank you very much, Rufus, um, for moderating our webinar, and uh, thank you to Ken for the invitation. Let me begin with a brutally frank snapshot of where the WTO is today. As we all know, the WTO has been floundering since the collapse of the Doha Round, with little progress being made on the rules-making front. Then one unnamed member decided that he wanted to cripple the appellate body and dismantle the two-tier dispute settlement mechanism. So there goes the WTO's adjudicatory function. Then when we thought that things could not get any worse, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us like a tsunami and inflicted severe social and economic hardships globally. The WTO has not responded. In short, the WTO is not sitting pretty. As a group of 13 WTO members that value the rules-based multilateral trading system, the Ottawa Group is naturally concerned about where the WTO is heading. More importantly, we are committed to doing what we can to strengthen the WTO. In this context, I would just like to share three thoughts on what WTO members can do to right the ship. First, we must re-engage the US so that it can once again play a leadership role in the WTO. The new Biden administration has an opportunity to reset the US engagement with the WTO. And I can assure you that every WTO member is looking forward to the US regaining its place as a leader of multilateralism rather than unilateralism and playing a constructive rather than obstructive role at the WTO. The US can begin its reset with two simple actions. One, the US should join the rest of the WTO members in endorsing Dr. Ngozi as the new Director General. This will be in accordance with the established rules of the game as agreed by all members in the procedures for the appointment of Directors General which was adopted by the General Council way back in 2002. And two, the US can begin a meaningful conversation with members on how to improve the dispute settlement mechanism with a view to appointing new members to reconstitute the appellate body. And my good friend, Stephen, had provided <coughs> a lot of information on that earlier. Second, we must rebuild the WTO. And here again, I have two suggestions. One, we must rebuild trust and strengthen confidence among WTO members. Unfortunately, the imposition of unilateral tariffs, the launch of trade wars and disregard for rules have led to greater polarization in the WTO. In this connection, it is imperative that the US-China relationship must move away from being a zero-sum game to one of competitive cooperation. Two, members must recommit to concluding important negotiations on agriculture and fisheries subsidies. Using fishery subsidies as, as an example, the WTO members have missed the deadline set by leaders to conclude the negotiations. This is truly unfortunate because the fishery subsidies negotiations were seen as a litmus test of the WTO's ability to deliver meaningful outcomes. Third, we must revitalize the WTO. This can be done by demonstrating that the WTO is still relevant and capable of delivering meaningful outcomes. One good example is the e-commerce JSI, which is a bright spot in the WTO. The relevance of e-commerce negotiations has been multiplied by the COVID-19 pandemic as the world has come to embrace digital activities. Together with Australia, George, Japan, Kazoo, Singapore is proud to work 
with 86 other, with 86 participants. And we have demonstrated our strong resolve to intensify negotiations, despite the challenges thrown out by the COVID-19 pandemic. Two, the WTO members should demonstrate that we can respond effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. Here, the EU-led trade and health initiative is a promising one. And this is an opportunity for the US to collaborate with all interested members to get this initiative off the ground quickly and ensure that trade does not impede access to medical supplies. Ottawa group members have also led by example, as demonstrated by the Singapore-New Zealand Joint Declaration on Trade in Essential Goods for Combating the COVID-19 Pandemic, which was issued in April 2020. And three, WTO members should advance on new emerging issues such as trade and sustainability. This will be an area of interest for the Biden administration and offers another opportunity for the US to reset its role in the WTO. Let me end by reiterating the three R's, re-engage, rebuild, revitalize. Thank you. Thank you, Hang Seng. And uh, I wanna turn now to, to George Mina, ambassador from Australia. And George, I thought maybe, you know, uh, Hang Seng just mentioned uh, the e-commerce JDI. Uh, so I thought maybe you could start there. You know, what are the benefits of an e-commerce initiative and how are we going to square this circle between um, high ambition on permitting cross-border data flows uh, and yet at the same time addressing concerns about privacy? Absolutely, Rufus, and uh, thank you for the invitation, as, uh, as I also wish to thank Ken. Uh, as Hung Seng's just mentioned, it is a bright spot in the negotiating landscape here in Geneva, uh, the e-commerce initiative. And uh, it's one of those areas of trade policy, Rufus, that really has benefited from uh, the disruption of the last uh, 12 months or so. It, we've seen a an acceleration. It's a it's a it's a, a very commonly observed thing. There's a, the the acceleration of the digital transformation that we've seen in recent months has been extraordinary. If you look at a company like McKinsey, which just surveyed its uh, global executives, they say that uh, their client base has seen uh, digital transformation accelerate by something like three to four years just in the last few months. Uh, one count, uh, you know, previously e-commerce penetration in the United States was forecast to reach about 24% by 2024. In fact, it grew from 17 to 33% just this year. So the, the digital transformation, the case for global trade rules to respond to this uh, new reality is very much there. And as uh, Hang Seng's just mentioned, uh, together with Singapore, and Japan, uh, Australia, the three of us have been working on an initiative to drive those global trade rules. We started the negotiations in January last year. Uh, we now have 86 members and we have uh, quite some momentum behind the initiative. So uh, this week, we were able, Rufus, to table what we call the consolidated negotiating text, uh, bringing together all of the textual proposals that we've uh, had on the table so far and demonstrating convergence in some of the areas uh, that we've been able to build up in the last few months. So uh, some of the uh, uh, the less sensitive stuff like uh, electronic signatures, uh, being able to, to, to strike contracts in the digital world uh, with, it, with ease, e-authentication, spam. We've seen some, some real convergence delivered in the last few months. Uh, things like open government data, paperless trading, online consumer protection, all of the, the, the absolute essentials of, of digital commerce uh, are going into this initiative. Uh, but we also recognise that there's some pretty significant high value elements to this exercise that we have to tackle. And while we've started with some of the, the lower uh, hanging fruit, if you like, to try and build momentum, we're very much uh, conscious, as you've uh, just asked me, uh, about the need to, to square the circle between the data flows issue, which is crucial to the future of digital commerce and the digital economy more generally as data 
drives much of that of that economic growth and some of the concerns that several members have about the need to give effect to uh, protections for personal privacy, etc. So we are working through that. We'll be tackling that early in the new year in earnest. Now, while this is an, an issue that's very important in respect of the digital environment we're in, it's also important uh, as a pathfinder, if you like, or a, uh, a new form of negotiating modality uh, by demonstrating what can be done in plurilateral format. A couple of my colleagues have already spoken about the challenges of making progress in, in a, a, a membership as large and as diverse as the WTOs. Now, in the history of the, of the WTO and the GATT and experts like yourself will understand that plurilaterals have always been a crucial element of the negotiating landscape. Uh, they are a, a, a key way to make, make progress. And this initiative will demonstrate, we hope, that it's an important part of, of rulemaking in the future. I'll leave my comments there, Rufus, and uh, I'm sure we can come back to some of that in questions. I yeah, know that's very helpful, George, and certainly what you're saying about the importance of plurilateral movement uh, in helping to move the whole membership forward on issues is, is absolutely vital. I want to turn now, uh, last but not least, to Ambassador Yamazaki. Um, and Kazuyuki, I wonder if you would maybe address a little bit, if you could, um, you know, Japan is part of this trilateral group with the US and the EU, which has been working on a number of issues uh, which could play into the reform agenda, uh, issues like subsidies and, and tech transfer and other things. I wonder if you might say a word about that and, and other issues you wanna talk about on the Ottawa group and its work. Uh -huh. Thank you, Rufus. And uh, I also, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to share our views. And uh, uh, the we, first of all, I, I, I would like to, you know, uh, on behalf of Japan, we appreciate uh, Canada for uh, organizing the Ottawa Group, uh, which provides us in Geneva and also the, uh, among the capitals to how to uh, sustain and uh, promote multilateral trade system. And uh, this you know, uh, dialogue format has uh, given us a very precious you know, opportunity, uh, including a political level to share and uh, compare our notes. And also uh, as was already introduced that uh, we uh, took up some initiative, including the uh, trade and health uh, so uh, uh, we consider that this format uh, has been very useful and uh, we are also looking forward to continuing this uh, dialogue. And uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has a very serious impact, down, downtown impact on trade as well. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, we cannot delay the discussion to a WTO reform. And uh, Japan is uh, very much committed uh, to reform of the WTO. And uh, uh, one of the elements uh, we, which we have been really committed is uh, e-commerce. As uh, Hun Sen and uh, uh, George uh, already explained, I, uh, I, I would not duplicate their explanations, but uh, uh, as two of, two, uh, two of my colleagues already mentioned that uh, we also consider that the data, you know, that there are many uh, issues as was explained, but uh, as was explained, but the data flow is uh, one of the uh, key issues uh, in the e-commerce negotiations. And uh, uh, Japan, uh, we, we were uh, the chair of G20 last year. And at that time we, you know, uh, proposed the uh, notion that uh, uh, free data flow with trust and uh, uh, but uh, this everybody can understand that the data should be flown with trust but the issue is that uh, what is a trust and uh, uh, in wto under the gsi initiative uh, we were getting into the discussion uh, very seriously uh, on the data issue and uh, it is uh, we I, I we expect that that you know this gsi uh, e-commerce negotiation in wto will provide for the um, uh, you know, uh, countries to uh, really uh, 
you know, negotiate the substance of uh, what would be the, uh, you know, should be the data flow with trust uh, in the future. And uh, uh, in order to facilitate that discussion, uh, as an, you know, uh, as Japan, uh, we have been providing, uh, you know, the forum, uh, which is called Osaka Track, and uh, we also, as a, you know, member, one of the members, I, uh, we would like to also promote this, you know, discussion. And uh, next, uh, as uh, as was guided, uh, I would like to touch upon the, uh, you know, subsidies, and. Uh, industrial subsidies and uh, uh, state-owned enterprises (SOEs). Uh, since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, countries have taken a broad range of government support measures for their uh, domestic industries damaged by the uh, lingering crisis. Although many of the measures are regarded as necessary and legitimate to cope with the crisis, it is said that some measures have disrupted trade and competition. We should be aware that the market distorting effects of uh, support measures uh, taken during the global uh, financial crisis about 10 years ago has caused the overcapacity problem at the end. So it is all the more essential to recall a level playing field in this regard, which constitutes the basis for fair international business environment and realize a ra rapid economic recovery at this juncture. This makes it even more important to send a clear warning against market distorting measures to strengthen rules on industrial subsidies and to establish rules to address market distorting be behaviors of SOEs. Uh, the, we had the last, this year, in January this year, uh, the, we had the, uh, Japan, uh, U.S. and the European Union, uh, we had seventh trilateral ministerial meeting and uh, uh, three members of the WTO reached an agreement on specific measures, including additional prohibited subsidies and enhanced notification systems. And uh, that agreement was uh, uh, distributed in, in the form of paper. We also agree that advanced discussions with other WTO members we strongly wish to promote discussion on this issue at the WTO based, uh, WTO based. and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, where we are on uh, subsidies and uh, SOEs. And uh, I would like to, at this, uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to echo that uh, the uh, other ambassadors, uh, the uh, argument to on the necessity of uh, you know, restoring apparate body function. And uh, Japan would like to, you know, uh, would like to engage in uh, substantive discussions on this, uh, especially from January. And uh, also on health, uh, health and trade issue, uh, I would really like to just, you know, uh, touch upon the importance of the, uh, you know, uh, the issue of excessive export restrictions at the time of this kind of crisis. And at this time, uh, we have unfortunately, we have seen that some, you know, uh, ex export restrictions on medical products. And uh, we are also worried about, the post, you know, in the future, uh, the export restrictions on agricultural products, food, uh, in this kind of crisis. So Japan varies away that uh, you know, tackling uh, this in initiative is tackling these problems and uh, prepare preparing for future possible crises. And and uh, at the lastly, uh, I also would like to touch upon the importance of uh, nominating a new director general uh, in the WTO. And as you know, that uh, in the WTO, director general is of course a manager of the secretariat. But at the same time, that person is also serves as a chair of trade negotiating committee, which oversees the entire negotiation of the WTO. So uh, uh, we hope that uh, you know, according to the agreed procedure, uh, a new DG will be nominated, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, together with the new DG, we would like to uh, re-energize the you know works on at the WTO. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kazuyuki. There's so many 
issues that you all have raised. It's it's hard to uh, to address them all in questioning, but I wonder if I could start maybe by doing a little informal polling of the five of you. And and uh, you know, Hang Sing laid out a number of of uh, issues here in in moving forward, moving the system forward, and in building back from from where we are. Um, but I thought I'd start with this leadership issue that Kazuyuki just mentioned that several of you mentioned. I'm just wondering if, um, if it would be fair to say that all of you right now see that the only real viable option for resolving the leadership question is to, um, is to get a consensus for, uh, for Minister Ngozi to become the next director general. Do you really see it viable that there's any other option besides that? Uh, for the membership at this point? Uh, <clears throat> and if that doesn't happen, where do we go from here? I don't know who wants to chime in, but um, let me start, I guess, Stephen. Well, look, I, I think there's much to be said for following the, the rules as we set them out. And it was established uh, before 2013 as to what the process uh, would be. I think that the, the Troika did uh, a very good job of clearly stating out those rules. The members agreed to the process. Um, they ran a very good, clean uh, process. And uh, now we're left with, uh, with the results. And so I think the results are clear. And I think the membership should then take the next step. Um, and um, take up the recommendation from, from the Troika. That's the way we had established the rules. We, the whole point of the three-step process was to drive towards a consensus candidate. I think uh, we got very close to that consensus candidate. Um, I think at this point, it might be useful just to, uh, to be patient, to consult a little bit more, to think a little bit more about this, but um, I don't think there was anything wrong with the process and I think we should follow that process. Others want to comment on that? Rufus, perhaps I can come in. I completely concur with what Stephen's just said about uh, the integrity of a, of a difficult, these are difficult processes, the integrity of a difficult uh, selection process that we've uh, uh, been, been through. It was managed well. Um, what I also want to say, though, is that uh, the leadership of the secretariat is one thing, and and, and that is important. But I think uh, if we just draw the lens back a, a notch, uh, a couple of my colleagues here have talked about the importance of driving the rulemaking and uh, and WTO law functions a bit further. That leadership's got to come from the membership. Uh, now we've got got a couple of key appointments in place uh, uh, in the EU recently, a new trade commissioner. We know that. Uh, uh, the U.S. is in the process of nominating a new USTR. These are important appointments, but I think as the system uh, finds its rhythm again on rulemaking, we are going to find that we need uh, leadership to come from the political level more generally. Uh, we're going to look for opportunities to engage ministers on a more systematic basis uh, in rulemaking efforts uh, so that we can, we can uh, drive that political momentum that's been so important over the years to making trade uh, initiatives effective here in Geneva. So I just make that point that we, we ought to think of leadership in, in a broader context as well. Uh, Rufus, uh, this is Didier, yes, Didier speaking. If I, if I can chip in. Yeah, of course, sure. we, we, need to solve, we need to solve this issue uh, as, as soon as possible. This is important for the system. But I, I would just like to um, elaborate on what George just said. It's right that we need leadership at political level, but we also need poli political leadership from the major players as well. And that's what we've been lacking. Uh, over the last years. I think the uh, big powers, they have a, an important role to play. When they are at loggerheads, it's clear that it's quite difficult for us, I mean, to make headways uh, at WTO. We middle grounders, that, for instance, in the context of the Ottawa Group, we have a big player in the Ottawa Group, but most of the others are middle grounders. Of course, we have ideas. We would like to advance 
uh, to advance discussion, to advance talks as well. Uh, but I mean, there is a prerequisite is that uh, some leadership also uh, should be provided by the big guys. And, and clearly we very much count on the uh, upcoming Biden administration to play this leadership role at WTO that the US used to play uh, normally. Thank you. Very good point, Didier. And in fact, let me let me pick up from that, ask the next question, because obviously several of you talked about e-commerce and its importance. I was on a program yesterday uh, hosted by the uh, Brazilian think tank, uh, Sebri, and Simon Evanet, who many of you know, was on there. And he, he was talking about the fact that it's it's more and more unthinkable that the WTO system can remain relevant if it isn't uh, addressing the whole area of the digital economy and the growth of e-commerce, um, that it, be, it will begin to look less and less relevant if it can't grapple with the needed kind of rules and understandings and, and openness of that system, and particularly given how important it, it became during COVID and how it's accelerated its, its uh, growth as, as a, part, a big part of world trade. So, I wanted to ask all of you, I mean, do you, do you agree with that assessment that it is absolutely crucial to address this? And the second part of that is, you know, going back to your leadership point, Didier, the main blockages on e-commerce, it seems to me that it isn't so much a developed, developing divide, although I'm sure there are issues there, but it is among the big players, including within the developed economies, but also with China, where um, these kinds of issues about the regime for regulation and for openness in the digital economy are crucial. So I wondered if, George, I, I thought maybe start with you or with, with you, Hang Seng, to, to talk about that issue, but get all of you uh, to give your thoughts on the record about that. Sure, Rufus. Look, um, you're right. There are some, uh, some big issues. Um, and the first question, I think, is... Uh, an easy one. Absolutely, we need some better rules of the road. We need uh, to to have uh, a, an agreement that does allow all of the WTO members who are interested to uh, define the way in which they'll set up their own regulatory frameworks. Now, as to the divides, the great divides, the divides about uh, whether this uh, digital economy project ought to be focused mostly on on goods facilitation or, or whether we should be trying to drive data, which is the, the lifeblood of the modern digital economy. Uh, uh, whether uh, we are focused on, 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 a, on an agreement that's, that's smaller and, 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 and higher ambition or wider and, 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 uh, and, and more inclusive. There, there's some big questions there for us. And, uh, and your point about whether the divides are actually more amongst uh, the industrialised world. Uh, I'd say to all of that, uh, yes, yes, and yes. There are some some very significant challenges here, and you you are right that uh, the transatlantic uh, debate about how to incorporate privacy within a framework of rules that encompasses data flows is going to be an absolutely critical challenge. Uh, but I'm I'm confident that with the uh, amount of 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 interest and engagement from the private sector behind this project, and the private sector on both sides of the Atlantic, you know, there will be a way through on, on that big issue. Um, equally, I think we should we should be thinking about just as as Kazu said earlier, um, some of the perspectives from the fastest growing region of the world, and that is the Asia Pacific. So there's there's a lot of rulemaking going on. Just just this last week, we've seen the entry into force of uh, a real path branding path-breaking initiative between Australia and Singapore, digital economy agreement, which really demonstrates the sort of rulemaking activity that's going on at the regional and bilateral level. I think we need to bring some of that back into uh, the multilateral talks uh, and see if we can uh, use some of that energy here multilaterally. I'll leave it there, Rufus. Uh, Hang Seng and Kazuyuki, you want to comment on, on that as well? Uh, yes, happy to. I endorse all that George has said. Um, I think there are three key divisions, divides. One is on the level of ambition, right? Whether we want high ambition 
or a mediocre ambition? I think on that question, uh, we are agreed among the three of us that for the JSI on e-commerce negotiations to be meaningful, uh, the outcome must also be commercially relevant to the private sector. Um, there is also the divide uh, between the developed and the developing. And the crux of the issue there is what has been labeled as the digital divide. Um, but I think we have to go beyond focusing on the digital divide because the purpose of formulating the rules to regulate e-commerce is really to see how we can narrow that divide. And what is often not recognized is that e-commerce benefit largely the MSMEs. Uh, the third divide has to do with the data issues and the, you know, whether it's privacy, um, localization, um, these are issues that are tough, but uh, they will need to be addressed. Um, so that's all I will Thank say. You. Thank you. Thank you. Kazuyuki. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucas. And uh, uh, I don't have much to be added uh, uh, <coughs> to the uh, George and the Hunsen. Uh, the, we, you know, unless new, the agreement uh, is commercially meaningful, uh, you know, there's no, you know, it's not worth it to, you know, and, and spend, you know, resources to negotiate. So we, we, the commercially meaningful agreement is uh, really uh, uh, requis, uh, kind of prerequisite. And as Hun Sen said that, uh, you know, in the development of the e-commerce, we believe that, uh, you know, developing countries, MSMEs, and even you know, gender, you know, the you know, work-life balance, uh, e-commerce has a, a potential to, you know, uh, cope with those in, uh, socio-economic issues anywhere in the world. So we really need the a very uh, broad coverage of multilateral agreement. Uh, as uh, uh, George said, that we have been already. Uh, engage, many countries already engaged in a bilateral or you know, regional uh, trade agreement, which contains the e-commerce. But uh, we really need a very broad range multilateral ones, so that uh, those you know uh, the divides or gaps uh, of, uh, in the society uh, can be uh, alleviated by e-commerce. And we would like to push forward uh, this you know uh, instrument. Uh, in that spirit. Thank you. Thank you. You know, just, just commenting briefly as an aside from the standpoint of business groups that are pushing on, on this digital and e-commerce negotiations. I mean, there's a very good story to tell there, obviously, about hundreds of thousands of small and medium-sized businesses, large countries and small developed and developing throughout the world who who this new e-commerce uh, world gives an opportunity for them to be part of the global trading system in ways they never could have envisioned before. But it also relies on their partnership with very large companies that provide the platforms, whether it's the advertising of their products on, on platforms like Facebook or the payment systems they need or the other uh, elements of, um, you know, express delivery and shipments around the globe. And obviously free data uh, transmission becomes an incredibly critical part of that without which these interconnected platforms and the small businesses can't work well. Um, so we'll be out telling that story. As you know, and NFTC has been very active on this. We have a separate foundation um, component in NFTC called the Global Innovation Forum, which has been working hard on on uh, getting that story around and has done a number of important reports on this, uh, which I recommend to you. But I wanted to turn now because Stephen, you know, you, you, you spent time talking about the dispute settlement issue and its importance. And, you know, I thought maybe what all of you could, could talk about in, in, um, as we wind down the, this part of the program is, 
How important do you feel it is to get this resolved and in, in to restore confidence in the system over the, uh, the course of 2021, realizing that it will take some time for uh, the Biden administration to look at this issue and its, its appointees to, to start to work with it. By the way, uh, I know Catherine Tai very well. She's, she's obviously an outstanding choice for this job with a tremendous background, including in WTO dispute settlement as a longtime lawyer at USTR. And I'm sure that she'll be uh, to be looking into how the U.S. Uh, wants to move forward. But I, I wonder if any of you want to sort of talk about why this you feel this this issue needs to be uh, part of the part of the uh, equation if you're really going to get a reform agenda going in the WTO. Well, from my perspective, this is critical, and it's critical for a number of reasons. The one is it would restore confidence in, uh, in the system because it is meant to be functioning. Uh, the members were supposed to be appointing appellate body members. We've broken our own rules by not moving forward on this. And what I've been hearing, um, and it's a troubling trend, is a number of WTO members who have been saying, what is the point of negotiating new commitments if we don't have a functioning dispute settlement system? I find that to be an enormously cynical way of looking at the WTO system, but, but that is um, a criticism that needs to be put to bed. So um, I think if parties are gonna operate in good faith, parties need to honor their commitments in the WTO. And that means that we need to get back to a fully functioning dispute settlement system. What we've been seeing already since the appellate body has fallen into abeyance is a number of parties um, appealing into the void, as we call it, where they take a, a panel decision and then appeal it where there's absolutely no means of the appeal to be heard, which means that the, the, the case itself goes into this purgatory where nothing can be done. And so this, this is damaging to our process. This was a very important and useful part of the process that needs to, needs to be fixed. I, when I said at the outset that I didn't think it was going to happen tomorrow, that's a recognition of the heavy workload that the Biden administration will have, the other priorities that they may have. But I think a signal from the Biden administration that says we're willing to talk will be very important. And as I said in my earlier comments, the membership is ready to talk. The Ottawa group members are ready to talk. The Walker process is, and the principles are in play. So um, let's get going. It's important. Others want to address that? Um, I don't hear any. Let me let me just uh, see if uh, we can also have you address um, briefly the importance of engagement on some of these issues that have always been challenges in the system, like subsidies and uh, uh, SOEs and other issues of that nature. Um, that um, that. Uh, that Ambassador Yamazaki talked about and see if, if there are any further comments from any of you on, on the importance of, of those issues to a reform agenda. George, maybe you could take a shot at this. I knew you'd start picking on some of us uh, quickly, Rufus. Uh, look, I'll, I'll just, uh, on the on the point that Stephen just made, because I, you know, I think it is important to add add, add, uh, add my voice to that that point he makes about uh, the willingness to to work within a framework of uh, of reform of the dispute settlement system such that it is responsive to uh, the needs of the membership, does deliver efficient uh, results, works within you know the ninety day period. And, and so forth. There is that willingness uh, in the membership to look at some of those long-standing concerns a number of us have had about the operation of uh, two-tier review. But uh, the broader point I'd make on all of that, and I'll come back to your point in a second, but the broader point I'd make is it is really, really important, particularly for those medium-sized economies like the one that I represent and, and a number of us represent, that the authority of world trade law 
uh, remains strong. That is the absolute fundamental bedrock of the global trading system. WTO, FTAs, bilaterals, regionals, you name it, it's the bedrock. And we've got to get uh, a restoration of that authority of world trade law. Now, to come to your question on the new subsidies agenda, um, I think it, it is crucially important. I mean, we're seeing in a number of, uh, of developed countries a, a, a concern about uh, competition, unfair competition, whichever way uh, you want to look at it. And it, it is important for us to be building on the tradition of, of, of the WTO agreements to, to ensure that that competition is fair and does respond uh, to the concerns of, of states that they are dealing in a, in a level playing field. I would add uh, quickly, and you'd expect me to as coordinator of the Cairns Group, that that, that uh, level playing field you know, ought to be seen not only in, in uh, the industrial sector, uh, but also in the agriculture sector, where uh, the vast majority of the WTO membership has got very significant stakes in, in seeing a reform of global subsidies in that area. So a subsidies agenda is important. We've got so much that we need to do, but absolutely it's a critical part of the picture. Um, Rufus, uh, this is Didier. Uh, perhaps on the on this issue of um, the level playing field um, and subsidies in, in general and industrial subsidies, um, we we should not lose sight of the fact that this is an extraordinarily difficult undertaking at at WTO. Because, I mean, uh, it's right that the trilateral have prepared a number of proposals. And it seems that they're still working at it. Perhaps Gazu can 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 supplement my account on that score. Uh, but um, if if we really want to make headways, we have to uh, to bring together all the main players here, you know. And uh, there is certainly a lot of work to do now to approach uh, those who are very skeptical uh, to uh, undertake any steps towards strengthening uh, disciplines on industrial subsidies. Um, and these will require a lot of diplomatic skills. And uh, I think the, the ground has to be very well prepared. So it's not just about getting together a group of like-minded, uh, designing what the rules can be and just uh, come to the table and, and put a proposal on the table, you know? Uh, it's really, I would say, preparing the ground upstream before uh, we start really uh, to have serious talks. Uh, and this is this is this is a real challenge. Yes, thank you, Kazu. Did you did you want to add anything there? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I you know uh, I agree with the views of uh, uh, the you know uh, Didier. Um, this is a very you know deep rooted serious issue, and uh, uh, the as I mentioned the, at, in the my first intervention the. Uh, this issue has been discussed among uh, uh, what we call trilateral, the uh, US, EU, Japan. And as I explained, that uh, we, you know, uh, trying to uh, create a kind of springboard for the uh, other WTO members to also, you know, uh, discuss uh, together. And uh, for example, the uh, uh, current subsidies uh, rules of WTO, uh, the always the burden of proof, uh, if we find some subsidies are very trade distorting and even inconsistent with the WTO, burden proof is uh, on the shoulder of the, uh, you know, the member who is claiming that the other member's subsidy is inconsistent. So we consider that it's a too much uh, to, you know, for, because the you know, subsidies is taken by another member. But uh, you know the other member needs to uh, the prove that uh, this subsidy is inconsistent with the WTO. So that is too much. So we would like to fix, uh, for example, uh, this you know element, or you know uh, the subsidies typically provided by the government, but uh, some you know members, uh, which is not uh, you know, purely the government, public some public bodies, uh, you know providing the subsidies. And uh, how to define the public body, uh, which can we can you know uh, make that case relevant to the WTO? We have to also you know uh, you know address that type of issue. Or, and lastly, 
the uh, uh, we need to find out that the, we the, there are what kind of subsidies are there in you know other members inside other members, but uh, of course there is a rule for notification in the current in existing WTO, but uh, uh, I, I, we do not believe that uh, this notification uh, is not working very well, so we miss many many subsidies, uh, you know, so we need to you know, fix that this, you know, transparency related uh, provisions of WTO, so that if you miss a uh, notification uh, of your own subsidy, uh, that subsidy could be automatically prohibited. That kind of, you know, uh, we need to uh, provide a very strong incentive to the WTO members to properly notify uh, their subsidies. So all those issues, uh, you know, in a trilateral level we have been discussing. And uh, uh, we hope uh, we will uh, try to share uh, those, you know, what we have been discussed. But still, it's uh, not, you know, uh, still in the course uh, of the discussion. So uh, that, that's uh, where we are, and uh, we would like to, you know, uh, you know, cooperate with the, you know, uh, other members of the WTO on this. Thank you. Be, be, before we we go to uh, the audience for for their questions, I I wanted to raise one other. Uh, area which we haven't talked about as much, but which obviously is critical, and that is the whole trade and environment area, and particularly um, given the emphasis that uh, a new Biden administration will be putting on climate change, on returning to the Paris Agreement, on a return to multilateralism generally. You know, if you look at their priorities, many of them we've already talked about are relevant to the Ottawa Group's work. Um, priority one for the Biden administration is the pandemic, and DDA has talked about the trade and health initiative. Another priority is restoring um, cooperation in multilateralism and working more closely with our allies and traditional trading partners. And that gets to issues like uh, getting away from these tariff wars and hopefully doing some things in, in the WTO in the future to avoid the use of say, for example, national security me measures as a pretext for protectionism. Uh, but another important area is going to be climate change and trade and what may be coming down in the road in the future. And I, I find it hard to believe that a long-term reform agenda in the WTO won't have to address that. So I, I'm wondering if there's any discussion among the Ottawa Group members about this issue and, and how you see uh, being able to work on this, including obviously with the with, uh, Catherine Tai and the U.S. team in the future. So, so Rufus, I would say absolutely. And uh, all of the, the members that are represented here are part of what we call uh, the Trade and Environmental Sustainability Structured Discussions, which were launched on uh, November 17th. Um, and the purpose of this is to deepen discussions at the WTO on the nexus of trade and environmental sustainability. Canada and Costa Rica are going to uh, be the co-conveners, at least at the outset. The notion is that we will have these discussions through the year with the lead up to MC, the next ministerial conference. And then we'll, we'll take stock and see where we are and, and how we might move forward on the trade and environment um, agenda and it's very much set up um, to begin that engagement with an incoming U.S. administration. We're, we're fairly optimistic that they would be interested in this, but but at this point, it's very much about how do we structure uh, those discussions and and the the number of themes that are that are floating around at this point are around climate change, um, circular economy, plastics is another one. Um, so yes, people are thinking about this and the, the, the middle grounders, the, those that are extremely committed to the multilateral trading system are saying, yes, we need to have a, a deeper and a, a, a more profound engagement on these discussions with a view uh, to actually achieving some results. So um, we're getting there and we're setting the table for that discussion. Others want to comment? Uh, Rufus, perhaps very, very briefly, you, you talk about climate change and trade. I mean, as you know, I mean, uh, certainly the uh, Ottawa Group is working on it. I mean, and we have been instrumental in um, uh, promoting 
uh, this uh, initiative on structured discussion on trade and environment sustainability. Um, but I, you know, there, there has been some unfinished business um, four years ago, in particular, the environmental good uh, agreement. Environmental instance, goods, yeah. Uh, that, so I, I don't know whether this is going to be revived uh, in the context of the discussions that we are going to launch. It was a prolateral initiative, as you know, but it fits very well with um, actions that can be taken just in order to mitigate climate change. Uh, there might be other, uh, other kind of actions which are quite relevant uh, to the activities uh, that are um, covered by, by by the WTO, but this is one issue, um, and, and I do not know. I mean, the um, probably as you know, Mrs. von der Leyen, uh, the president of the EU Commission, um, mentioned that uh, the EU is, would be developing a kind of border tax adjustment, and I, I understand. I'm, I may be mistaken, but the, there is also an interest from the Biden administration to work on that score. And probably there might be some transatlantic discussion on this that could, if this process would generate some outcome, have an impact on the work at WTO. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the Environmental Goods Ag Agreement, Didier, because um, my, my organization, among many others, was strongly supporting that. I think it's, it's pretty clear that a Biden administration is going to put a big emphasis yeah. on what we can do to incentivize, um, you know, a lower carbon uh, economy through, uh, through the trading system. And, you know, obviously there are a lot of linkages to, to things like the climate change agreement, but also to existing things that were going on in, in the, in the WTO on, in, in, in the Doha round. So um, I'm glad to hear you to raise that. I'm wondering, um, Ken, if you want to come back in at this point or if you want us to ask further questions. Obviously, if we have questions from the audience, I'm, I'm sure that our I can get our, our uh, colleagues here to, to uh uh, maybe I'll work with you on that, Rufus, and you can help me direct some of the questions that have come in. Well, um, why don't you go ahead and ask them? All right, I will do that. Um, thank you all for your comments thus far. We're, gonna, we're, we're in the home stretch. We just got a few more minutes left, and we're going to wrap up. And I know we are across multiple time zones here um, with uh, Ambassador Tan in, in Singapore at the moment and others in Geneva. Um, so we'll try to wrap this up quickly. So one question that comes in from our good friend, Wendy Cutler, who many of you may know, uh, former uh, U.S. Uh, uh, major negotiator on, on uh, TPP, for, among other things, um, mm -hmm. asked, what are the uh, prospects for the Ottawa Group bringing in more new members, including ones that may have uh, uh, not be willing to take on all the same obligations? And do you think that the group will take some of the good work it's done thus far and submit some concrete proposals for improving the rules? So I, I think this notion of uh, the Ottawa group increasing its membership or this, this issue about whether the uh, Ottawa group new members would, would adopt our rules is, is a, perhaps a misunderstanding of, of the Ottawa group. It's, it's much more of a ginger group and a discussion group um, with ideas coming forward than it is about um, purity tests. Um, but, but absolutely there is scope within the Ottawa group to talk about um, how we might go about developing new rules. And, but the idea really is about using that as a, as a bit of a hothouse. I know I'm throwing in a lot of metaphors here, but um, using it more as a hothouse and then taking that out. So setting the table for a broader uh, discussion. And what we have said in the Ottawa group as well is we would welcome any member of the WTO who wants to sit down with us to talk about reform initiatives. And so, and this has happened on a number of occasions and, and we continue uh, to welcome that. So it's, it's not about actually growing the number of Ottawa group members, it's about growing the ideas and extrapolating them out into the broader uh, membership for action. Very good, thank you. You know, it, it uh, segues to a slightly related question. You talked about the uh, surface, that the group is, is a forum for surfacing ideas. Um, I don't know exactly what ginger group means. Um, I'll have to learn that phrase. Um, but um, one question that came in from Jeffrey Pigman was ha, ha, just asking you all um, about the shift to a virtual hybrid negotiating format since the pandemic began. 
um, how that has affected the communication within the group, um, what you think that might mean for the WTO going forward uh, for negotiation and, and what has been your experience? I know this is sort of a functional question, but it's one that you know, where it's gonna be with us for several more months uh, at least, and but maybe also offers, offers some opportunities for new ways of doing things. Do you see us, us having uh, maybe this uh, beginning a new era or a different style of, of negotiating and, and communicating? You're all in ministries for many years as well and uh, have engaged in many kinds of negotiations, not just at the WTO. So curious what your thoughts are. George, uh, George I think you had your hand up. Ken, look, I'm happy to have a go at that. I'm sure others have got observations. Um, it's been quite... Uh, a journey, and I'll, I'll know two uh, interesting effects. The first is that we lose something. Uh, now we can we've been doing a marvelous uh, job, I have to say, uh, of of driving some some formal textual negotiations forward in virtual format in the e-commerce negotiations. I've seen it in various other negotiating groups. We've lost what's essential at an endpoint of a negotiation, and it's. It's, it's a very human, uh, a very sort of co the corridor discussions, uh, the ability to craft consensus in small groups, uh, looking people in the eye. That 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 element needs to <laughs> needs to be fed back. But we've gained something as well. And and what we've gained, um, as I've experienced it, is uh, an unprecedented connection with our own capitals, an unprecedented means by which our own capitals are fully engaged. In what we're doing, and that's a good thing. It, it, it for the, those of us at one end of the earth, uh, that's a it's a very tiring thing. Uh, it, it, it's it's really not not fair when I have to tell my colleagues they have to start a negotiation at one a.m. and finish at four a.m. They're not always delighted by me, but uh, it has allowed that kind of uh, uh, connection, which hasn't always been there in the past, to to be fostered. Anyone else want to jump in or should we go to the next question? I would just say yeah. I, I fully agree with George's observations. There's good and there's bad to the virtual. And there is something very important about those, those corridor chats, but also engaging with capitals and allowing greater participation from smaller members has, has, been, um, has been really interesting. So perhaps there is a, a hybrid way forward after COVID-19. And just to add, um, from a sustainability point of view, it really reduces a lot of the carbon footprint uh, and it saves a lot of money. <laughs> certainly, certainly a, a benefit. I will say, uh, having personally had an opportunity is when I was uh, worked in the U.S. Congress to sit in on some negotiations at the in the WTO, watching the body language and the eye contact that was made between negotiators and the subtle head nod or eyebrow raise, you, you just you can't, it doesn't work in this digital format in nearly the same way. So I, I certainly understand that. Um, question that came in uh, from Penny Noss, a friend of, of many of us in Washington at UPS. Uh, she asked about yesterday that the WTO hosted the first meeting of the working group on women in trade is there anything that the ambassadors can comment on about this initiative and how it can contribute to uh, address inequalities around women that have surfaced, especially during the COVID-19 crisis? I'm really Even? sorry to disappoint, uh, Penny. No. I, I was not at that meeting. I was triple booked at the time. So I, I can get back to you on that, but I can't tell you at this moment, sorry. All right. That's all right. We know that that's a big issue. Uh, the agenda, the gender issues are, are front and center for the Canadians. And so I um, uh, appreciate your willingness. I'll, I'll, we can circulate that information to you and to your teams. Um, so another question comes in, um, a couple related, and, and Ambassador Tan, this may go back to some of the things you originally talked about, about the fight against COVID. Um, Pascal uh, Kernis, um, who is with uh, European Services, asks, uh, thank you for, uh, thanks everybody for mentioning services in the fight against COVID. Without services, health, transport, logistics, IT, et cetera, no trade of essential medical equipment, pharmaceutical products, or vaccines can take place during the pandemic. Smooth services trade is essential. Will this new in healthcare initiative encompasses measures on services trade?
Ambassador Tan, you're muted. Thank you. Well, of, of course, that is an integral and important part of uh, what we have to address. Um, one of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been a disruption in supply chains. And that is a serious problem. Um, and what we have seen, uh, which is encouraging, are countries or members either bilaterally or in a smaller group um, coming to agreement among themselves or between the two of them um, to ensure that supply chains on essential medical services, essential medical supplies do not get disrupted. And I think there is value um, for members to engage in such modest, but I think valuable uh, initiatives. Uh, I had earlier mentioned the initiative between Singapore and New Zealand. Um, so these are the kind of in initiatives that can, in a way, serve as catalysts. Thank you. George. Ken, uh, quick, quick comment on this and, and a quick one on the earlier question. On this one, uh, I agree totally with Hang Seng on, on how important uh, services is as part of the supply chain response question. Uh, I'd also say to Pascal's question that he will be well aware of the low-key but incredibly high-value initiative underway on services trade reform, the domestic regulation and negotiations that are being chaired by Costa Rica. That is uh, crucially important for the future of services trade because we know a lot of services trade barriers are at the domestic regulatory level. Uh, and it's going really quite well. So it's important that we, we business gets behind that initiative. Uh, uh, on the trade and gender uh, question earlier from Penny, uh, we need to look analytically and carefully right through our negotiating uh, work to see how the gendered impact of, of trade can be uh, improved and addressed. And, and uh, earlier, I think Kazu spoke well to the importance of e-commerce in driving inclusion in the digital, in the, in the, in the new global economy. And, and that's one way we can boost the role of women in, in the global economy. Another thing we've got to do is improve the representation of our colleagues in Geneva, as you can see from the screen. Uh, that's all of our fault and, uh, and uh, that of our governments. Uh, yes, Ken, yes. Ken, if I may, on, on uh, services and, uh, and supply chains and, and this uh, trade and health initiative. Um, I think clearly services uh, do have a key role to play, as Hung Sang mentioned. And um, when we launch uh, this um, trade and health initiative, uh, there will certainly be exchanges on, on services and on how uh, to improve trade and services and the functioning of supply chain, which are which are, as we know, supported by, by services in, in many respects. I mean, uh, cargo, freight, logistics, etc. cetera. And, and, and probably uh, this discussion will take place in the context of the unfolding of the initiative. Uh, no, um, very shortly, um, the, um, just Didier touched upon that, uh, you know, e-commerce negotiation, uh, we will, you know, uh, have a discussion on market access of some you know sectors uh, in the future and of course you know we are fully aware of the impact of covid uh, crisis so uh, uh, in the course of e-commerce negotiations uh, because of the covid if we consider that the some you know uh, service sector is really really relevant to be included uh, as a, you know a sector negotiated uh, as a market tax negotiation in e-commerce, I think that's possible. So I think that, you know, the point I just heard is a very, you know, uh, for me, very useful comment. So I just wanted to appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And I do, I do want to comment. Um, we did, um, we 
we we when we decided to host the auto group for this session it necessarily limited the number of countries that we were going to be reaching out to including the potential diversity of the panel we did reach out to um, all the latin american members of the the, the group uh, to take part in the various scheduling things that didn't work out, but it was more based on geography and trying to get that kind of representation. But we, we do like to have a gender balance on most of our panels and, and, uh, and I apologize that we weren't able to achieve that here. I guess we're wrapping up. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, uh, where we started this conversation was when you know I mentioned that we are in a transition in the United States. The U.S., and this plays off of a question a little that Roberto Zapata, who I think is a, a friend and former colleague of some of you, um, asks, uh, you know, the U.S. moved in some different directions on trade away from multilateral and much more towards bilateral over the past four years. We do have a new administration coming in. Catherine Tai knows these issues as well as anyone in the United States, having been a close observer and active participant in these discussions in her role as the Chief Trade Counsel of the House Ways and Means Committee. So she's very familiar. How do you envision and what is there any last messages maybe you want to send um, uh, before the end of the year to the incoming administration um, about your thoughts about working with them in the in the year to come, in the years to come? Well, can I start off by saying hello to Roberto? It's great that he's uh, He's there. He was a great colleague of ours in um, uh, in Geneva, and I would say, look, I, I I'm pretty confident in saying on behalf of the Ottawa Group that all the members of the Ottawa Group are ready to roll up our sleeves and to engage with the new administration on uh, on reform of the WTO, on new rules. Uh, the, the the spirit is absolutely uh, willing to uh, for that engagement, and there are some significant issues and challenges where uh, there's there's a group of like-minded members who are more than willing to to move forward on those issues so um, I think we're ready and we're ready to engage any other closing words Can, Rufus yes just if I could first of all thank everybody uh, I uh, for an excellent uh, discussion. I do want to pick up briefly on the point that Penny Nas, who's a member of my board, made about, about the importance of gender and women's empowerment. And part of it, of course, is, you know, um, personnel is policy and leadership, um, putting women in more leadership positions and certainly hope that we're going to see a WTO with the first ever woman director general. Um, it's, of course, also important to point out that Catherine Tai, although she's not the first, she, I think she's the fourth woman to be USTR. She is the first woman of Asian um, descent and uh, certainly uh, shows a strong commitment on the part of the US. And I, I think this is a terribly important area for us to be looking at. And, and I agree with George about issues like e-commerce where you know that affords so many opportunities to get half of the world's population more involved in trade and commerce uh, in a meaningful way. And there are a lot of barriers there uh, from their access to, you know, to credit and payment systems and their ability to contract and many other things. And I think these are gonna have to be part of the international discussion as we, we move into a, a, a new world of, of global commerce. But I wanna thank everybody and you Ken for what I think has been an excellent, uh, excellent panel. Thank you, uh, Rufus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassadors. Uh, really grateful to all of you for taking the time uh, to spend, uh, share your thoughts with us. We hope to have you back again. As I mentioned, we're going to be keeping up the virtual platform at WIDA. We work with many, uh, if not all of your embassies here in Washington. We're very grateful to all of you uh, for joining us today. Wish you all a, a good holiday season, a safe and healthy uh, a holiday season in, in the weeks to come and look forward to engaging with all of you in uh, the next year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Rufus. Uh, we'll be hearing from all of us uh, again soon. Um, best, best wishes to everybody. Uh, everybody stay safe and wear a mask. Thank, Thank you. you.